the Quinn Mar Show. This show is brought to you by Bing Pot Trivia. How many times have you been to a trivia night where it just felt like somebody reading questions? Well, Bing Pot Trivia prides themselves on bringing high energy, dynamic hosts to every event. The show leans heavily on visual elements. Their questions are designed to make you laugh or roll your eyes, while also challenging your knowledge on pop culture, high school science, culinary arts, and everything in between. Their typical show runs five rounds, including a photo round, general knowledge on pop culture, riffs on different game shows, absurd 50-50 questions, and a super sweet music round. Check out bingpottrivia.com today to book your trivia night. Again, that is a bingpottrivia.com. Tell my boy Danny that your friend Quinn sent you. All right, let's get on with the show. My next guest has been in the content creation game for over a decade. From the first time I saw him chatting about Twilight to Nicki Minaj's butt to now playing video <laughs> games and literally just shooting the breeze, I always knew he was my type of creator. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Quinn Mar Show, Ethan Woods. Ethan, my man, what's going on? <laughs> hey, what's going on? It is. It's a pleasure to be here, Quinn. You're the very first interview I have ever done, so I am happy and excited to be a part of this. Hey, man, I I, I appreciate. It. I'm I'm happy you're 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 on here because I was just mentioning to you before we started that I used to watch you as a kid, even though we're the same age. It was just like cool watching <laughs> another kid. You know what I mean? Like you always felt older to me too, which was a weird thing. Yeah, that's. I think that's like the the perspective a lot of people tend to have when they're watching somebody online because they don't always necessarily know their age. They right. just feel they just get a vibe of someone that they can relate to. Like, oh, I like this person, and yeah. then time comes later. It's like, wait, this guy's only a year older than me, or this guy's only like a couple months younger than me. Right. Like, what? Like, What's it's so funny because I was strange. Just, I was just it's telling cool. you, I went to back and rewatched your first one, and watching it then, you look a lot younger than you were. <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. It was 2011. So you were you were like what third year, 14? I, I was uh, I was 13 actually when we recorded the episode because we uh, recorded that first episode back in August. My birthday's in September, true. so we filmed it when I was 13, but it aired in November after I had turned 14. Okay, yeah, because but like watching it, it's like is this is, you look like a nine or ten year old. <laughs> you, bro. Yeah, I got a baby face. Dude, hey, I, people say the same thing about me. I got ID'd. It's obviously 18 to get a lottery ticket. A few weeks ago, I got ID'd. I'm 27. So, I mean, oh. I'll, you got to take it, man. Yeah, I mean, I was walking through Vegas uh, just a couple weeks ago, and I got I got carded like three different times. Not even gambling. Just standing at a casino table just watching. Just Ooh, watching people shit. gamble, trying to learn the game. I got carded three different times. I'm like, That's come on, man. Jokes. Jesus. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into um, your past, but we'll talk really quick about Vegas. So you went there for TwitchCon. What was that like? So TwitchCon is an interesting environment. I kind of already had an eyeball for what I thought it was going to be like uh, because I went to VidCon back in 2016 when I was still with FBE and React. And it had a very similar vibe to me because it is for the really big creators who have either meet and greets going on or they're there to meet some other really big creators, create some collaborations, or it's just for the super fan who's going to meet their favorite creator, their favorite streamer, and so on. And so that was kind of the idea I had going into it. And that's pretty much exactly was it what, uh, what it was. A lot of big creators getting together to do meet and greets for their fans and then meet with the other larger creators and then the bunch of super fans running around grabbing as many pictures as they could meet and greets and then uh you know grabbing art and stuff and the art installments were really dope but for the most part i would say those are uh, twitchcon and any of those conventions are really for the really big creators or yeah. someone who happens to be a really big fan of these creators it's funny you mentioned vidcon because like i think when it was at its like peak was like a 2012 2013 maybe actually even before that man like the 2008, 2009, like those creators of YouTube, those VidCons and shit, dude, they were huge. I, I you know what? I, I believe it. I believe yeah. it. When I went, I was very underwhelmed. <laughs> oh, yeah. and in 2016, as a 19-year-old, as a I was very underwhelmed. I was like, this is it? Yeah. I mean, I, I spent my, most of my time in the arcade, just making making people look bad in the arcade. Like, that was my fun. <laughs> no, but honestly, dude, it's because it's it just died off, like, things like that. Like, things now are taking over, like, TwitchCon. So, it makes mm. sense. That, like, when you went, it was like, this is – what? why am I here? Like, this yeah. Is <laughs> That's 100% my vibe the entire time I was walking around. I was like, man, I almost feel like I wasted my money. <laughs> did you go by yourself? Yeah, I did go by myself, yeah. yeah. 
I mean, Andy. granted, there were some other uh, creators that I knew there, like Chelsea and Michelle from React. Oh, they were okay. also at TwitchCon. So, you know, met up with them a little bit. Oh, and Ray was also there. So, you know, met up with a few other of the old school reactors. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting experience, to say the least. Would you, would you go again? I would only go again if I, uh, or, you know, ideally plan becoming a bigger creator. So where it's, you know, more reason for me to go, like if I'm an actual Twitch partner, then I'm like, all right, there's more reason for me to go. Cause I'll have access to some of the partner stuff to be able to interact with other Twitch partners. Like the, like one thing I was annoyed I couldn't go to, which for understandable reasons, because I'm not a Twitch partner was these Twitch parties that the partners would get invites to. And I'm like, that's what I need fucking access to. Cause that's where all the people yeah. that you'd want to collaborate with the people you want to talk to the people that are even higher ups of companies and things they're interacting with the partner creators. They're not talking to some random fucking affiliates that are just walking the floor, which is what the vast majority of TwitchCon was. That's so, true. And that's like, the that's part I was upset about. I was like, damn, I can't get to the parties. Oh, well noted for next time. You got a year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, what? and I'm, I'm like, I don't know if it's arrogance or just my sense of ambition, but like, I think I could get up to that level in a year. Yeah. I mean, why not? Like when I, whenever I join your streams and stuff, like you have like a decent following, you know what I mean? Like you, like, yeah. you, may, you may not have like thousands of people in your stream, but the, the people you do have, those are, you got some loyal guys in there. Yeah. And I, uh, I could only, I can, I couldn't, I couldn't be more grateful for them. Honestly, like the fact that I, and some of them, the fact that they've followed me for as long as react from when I was doing it there, they followed me to when I started streaming a little bit when I was like 18, 19 on my Xbox. And that was before it was so fleshed out, it would work better. I had to turn down, I, I would like, I would stream on my Xbox playing whatever game, but if I wanted to change games, I'd have to close the whole stream down and then start it back up again completely with the new game up. So it completely end stream, open stream, end stream, open stream. It was awful. And that was part of the reason I think I stopped back then instead of keeping it going, trying to figure out a way to make it work. But the fact that even a couple of those people stuck around and are still coming into my stream today, I I couldn't be more grateful for it. That's it's, the biggest thing, man. Like, it's like, wild. Not everyone's gonna start off with like thousands and thousands of people on a day. Oh yeah. Stream, but like not uh, the same thing. Like it, it's just as important to have those little like, people. So it's like that's a good start. Yeah. No. I was. I mean, I was even telling some of my uh, my chat early on when I was just doing some test streams. Like I don't even need the hundreds of people in my in my like in my chat whatever talking stuff i am content with 10 viewers that are consistently just talking and saying what's up in my chat and then letting it grow from there it's because i'm very much more a man of quality versus quantity because you could have all those bunch of you know viewers and shit but you're also probably not doing content that you enjoy making you're just going for the trend the reactions and all that stuff which you know yeah i can bring you money but i'd personally prefer a higher quality community versus a higher quantity community having some good solid people in my community that show up frequently that talk that say what's up and then have that grow over time because then that's what i know i have people that are genuinely there for my personality for just talking to me getting my opinion on things versus just oh he does funny faces and big reactions like right. uh, to me that gets so so boring so fast and that's what i was gonna say like it seems like your the people in the chat there on your streams are like on the same vibe as you as well like there's they're in like in like on the same jokes as you you know what i mean it's not like you guys are polar opposites or you're trying to put on a show to like just to entertain you yeah, guys it, no. seems like, it seems like you're just friends with your with your viewers yeah i i for one thing for me when it comes to the presenting yourself on the internet and this goes back as far as react um when i knew i was going to be such a public face on the internet for so long i was just like i want to make sure i don't let any of this notoriety any of this fame any of this celebrity get to my head and so i was like i'm going to continue being as real as possible so the way you see me on react the opinions i give on react my controversialness my you know my hating everything that's just me I and I'm going to be that way in person. And I think it's funny when I've come across meeting some people in person, they were surprised that I was pretty much the same personality they saw on the show in real life. They're like, oh, you're just this way. Like they didn't read. They realized it wasn't a persona. I'm not being a dick on camera right. just to be a dick on camera. Like, no, that's just me. Yeah, you're, <laughs> that's you're just me. Honestly, and we'll, and we'll get into that because there was a video that came out last year. A couple ex reactors that talked about <laughs> that talked about expressing their opinion. So we'll get into that. But let's go back quickly. So like you're you you live in L.A. now. Did you grow up in L.A.? Yes, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. So what's what's that like being a kid in L.A.? Uh, it's I would say it's interesting, especially because I also grew up so 
Just because I grew up in L.A., it doesn't necessarily mean you have an entertainment background. There's plenty of people in L.A. that live on, you know, some of the outskirts of L.A. They're not near Hollywood. They're not near any of the, the entertainment stuff. I, fortunately, uh, happen to be raised within a 20 to 30 minute drive of Warner Brothers Studios. I happen to live within a very nice location that allows me quick access to all these studios. I mean, and and be part of that, I did grow up with a background in entertainment. I was a kid actor before I started doing the react stuff, started doing acting when I was like 11. And I, you know, I've had auditions at Nickelodeon, Disney, Paramount, uh, all of these huge studios. And it's it's interesting. I am very I tend to be very jaded to a lot of the whole entertainment celebrity thing because I kind of did some of that, obviously. I mean, to a degree, I'm no I'm, I don't see myself as a celebrity at all, even though other people give me that title. It feels strange, but it's it's interesting growing up with such a Hollywood background because I see entertainment so differently than everybody else does. And I think that's part of the reason I don't get pulled into the fanfare that tends to happen with anyone of celebrity status, whether they're on the internet or TV or movies. Because I've met, you know, celebrities like Stallone and George Lopez and people like that, just because they were taking their kids to a basketball game or a volleyball game that just so happened to also be playing against the school I was going to. So, so weird. I, yeah, it's super strange. I mean, even growing up when I was playing sports, I played flag football against Michael Jackson's kid, like his son, Prince, the older son. Yeah. I I played football against him. I knocked his ass over twice in a game. <laughs> like that is, as soon as I learned that was Michael Jackson's son game, I was like, I need to knock his ass down. And yeah. so that was you my goal. Want people to know I'm the guy that knocked, that knocked yeah, down. Yeah, like I, at kid. the very least, I could always have that. It's like, yeah. man, I knocked not Michael Jackson's kid down as this, uh, when I was playing football. Like, let's go. Yeah. So growing up in LA, it's had a lot of interesting experiences, but at the same time, those experiences have kind of made me jaded to entertainment as a whole and very much more see it as a business versus this whole starry eyed. Oh my God, who are these people type of thing? Yeah. So, so what did your parents do then? Um, my dad yeah. has worked corporate legal in entertainment. He actually works corporate legal in Warner brothers. And then my mother's worked, uh, in entertainment. She's done administrative. She's also worked in sales doing, uh, other like construction related things. So my parents have, a jack of all trades and i've kind of followed that path in my own right having done some degree of acting and then doing stuff behind the scenes working at new egg and then um my brother uh writes and uh, and he's a working actor and you know this this strike is really painful for him which is understandable for anyone working in entertainment right now um yeah. but yeah my whole family just comes from entertainment so i just kind of ended up falling into that wheelhouse and it working out rather well for me at least so far See, that's really cool because, um, like you said, not everybody in LA grew up in that way, but, but for you, it's just so normal, right? Yeah. And like, were, were you, did you have friends that were like that? And then on the opposite side that were like, where parents were just like trades or contractors. Absolutely. Teachers. Yeah. See, absolutely. Well, what was that like? Like, did you have like a specific group that was just like mixed between all of you? I would say my group, like my group of friends in general throughout various periods of my life have always been pretty mixed. I've have the friends like even right now, I have friends that work in entertainment as uh, audio engineers, as musicians, as we're as actors pursuing. And then there's the flip side of the friends who one's uh, one's a, a working as a chef in trades. And then I have another friend who uh, a, who owns a, or whose boyfriend owns a bar and then she occasionally works there. Like it's interesting seeing so many different sides of people and me coming from such an entertainment background, I tend to see myself drawn to other people who have that entertainment background just because it provides that level of relatability. But at the same time, I'm still like, Oh yeah, well, we went to high school together and you're doing, you're a lawyer now. Oh wait, you work in real estate. What? So it's, it's very interesting just seeing all the different directions people have gone. Cause I also went to an arts high school. So you'd assume everybody would try to do something entertainment related. Nope. The vast majority don't even end up pursuing what they were pursuing in high school. They're like, oh yeah, I'm a radiologist now. I'm like, the fuck you were in yeah, dance geez. in high school. What is this? Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's really wild to seeing the huh. different paths people have gone, even within the city of LA being so entertainment focused. Okay. Well that also answers my question then about like uh, you as a kid, like your hobbies, obviously sports, acting, clearly video games. So for you, like getting into auditions and stuff, like, what were those like? I'm assuming your first things you booked were commercials. So that's kind yes, of like, correct. Ma yeah, it's mainly what like uh, the kids growing up in LA that want to get in that business do. What was your first commercial? 
Um, first commercial was a GoDaddy commercial. Uh, part of a so so as an actor, when you're especially when you're starting out, you end up doing a lot of free stuff, and uh, just to you know get exposure, get that build up your resume. And the first one I did was a GoDaddy commercial that was part of a GoDaddy contest. And the winner of that contest, their commercial would then get officially used by the GoDaddy website, and uh, they would get paid out ten thousand dollars. Unfortunately, we didn't win, but we made it to like the top five, which was really cool. Did you get anything um, for it or no? I'm ah, no, I didn't get anything for it. It was just it was just the exposure and being able to put yeah. that on my resume. You know, as as an eleven year old who just goes, yeah, ha ha. You know, <laughs> you don't really think of anything more than having fun. Uh, it's all your parents really taking, uh, making sure, managing you, and making sure everything's okay, and they, you know, hopefully not taking advantage of you. But yeah, uh, yeah it didn't get anything out of that. But the GoDaddy commercial would have been the first one, and auditioning and doing stuff in LA for me, I, again, as a kid, I fell into it. It wasn't even something that I wanted to do like i didn't drive to be an actor it's like oh yeah i want to be on tv i was actually the kid that every time like so in la I, this probably happens elsewhere too but there'll be you know plenty of uh entertainment people casting directors producers whatever walking around minding their business gro buying groceries and so on and so i would just be out with my mom or my dad or just with my family and we'd just be at the store or something and some random person would approach us and go, hey, do you want to be on TV? And I would just look at them and go, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mom uh, and then my mom obviously would end up, you know, talking to this person. And the person would give my mom a card and be like, well, if he ever wants to, you know, be in like TV or something, you know, let me know. And my mom was like, OK. And she and she would just look down and go, Ethan, are you sure? And I'm like, why would I want to be on TV? Yes. Like That was always my response as a kid. And the only reason I actually ever ended up in acting was because my brother ended up taking an imp improv class. Now, my brother's five and a half years older than me, so I looked up to my brother a lot because he was so much older than me, especially as a kid. And um, when I saw him do his first improv class and he had his first little improv show, I was, as a 10-year-old, as a I was like, that looks like so much fun! And so that's why I started doing acting. No other reason other than I oh. thought it looked fun. Just to do what your brother is doing. Exactly. Like, do what like, my brother's he, doing because it looks fun. He could have been like, I don't even know, doing anything else. He could have started uh, to fucking, he could have jumped off a cliff. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. just because your, <laughs> your big brother's doing it, you want to do it too. Yeah, yeah. I was very much that little brother. I was very much that little brother. I was like, oh, my brother's doing it. I want to do that. Yeah. That was very much me. So that's, that's pretty much how I ended up falling to acting and even ended up doing React in the first place. Yeah. So I like that you mentioned improv because like um, I, I always want to be an actor as a kid. And like I even took drama in high school. And the one thing I hated with a passion was improv. Really? Like, yeah. Like, I, I mean, I think I'm like pretty creative, but like just getting up there and doing an improv is something I hated. Like I can have like a group of people and like I love telling stories or like trying to make them laugh. Like making a group full of people laugh is one of the best feelings ever. Ah, uh, yeah. hundred percent. Like, doing presentations 100%. or something like improv, I hate it. So like for you, what attracted you to improv? Obviously other than your brother doing it, like once you got into it, what was really like, Oh yeah, I like this. That's, that's actually, that's a fantastic question. And I think part of the reason that I was drawn to improv, uh, because I did do some improv classes of my own and an improv show of my own later when I got old, as I got older. Um, but I think what drew me to improv was the freedom was the the lack of thinking the thinking without thinking because with improv it's very much you're just going off of all the ideas that are thrown off you're not really thinking about what's being said it's very much a game of yes and which is which is actually a pretty common improv game you're saying yes and and then you go along with the next person says because when you say no or you stop something it prevents the story from moving forward when all you want to do is keep the story going forward no matter how wild it gets and i think that's what drew me to improv was the free flow of it. And it's just, you're reacting to everyone else's ideas and trying to build on someone's idea. And you can take someone else's idea and make it really funny out of literally nothing. And mm -hmm. I think that's part of what pulled me into improv was just that, that freedom and that need to be quick on your feet. And I think that's what, uh, I still, I think still like that about improv today. And if anything, that's actually come in real handy, uh, when I was doing hosting on new egg and then just streaming as an individual, like being able to have that improv background and literally talk about anything for any period of time, just because mm -hmm. I find to be extremely handy. And improv, I think, is something that works in multiple facets of life aside from just entertainment. Just when I was working as a normal person, working in sales as a retail salesman or even in real estate, being able to go off on tangents with your customers about any random topic, even if you don't have the basis of information on it, just kind of being able to BS your way through a conversation and make that person feel satisfied. 
It's very nice and very, that's, very handy. That is so true. I've never really put those two together. Improv is literally just bullshitting. That's literally bullshitting. Oh, damn. That's literally okay, bullshitting. Okay, well, I mean, I, I like to say a lot of the time that I'm good at bullshitting. So maybe, I guess, maybe I'm good at improv. I don't know. <laughs> like, I used to bullshit my way through school. And, like, I like I, you know what I mean? Like, the improv. It's the improvise. Like, as an adult. So, huh, interesting. I never yeah. really thought of it like that. I never put the the connection together. Huh. Yeah. I always so, attested improv and BS as, as one and one. It's like, hmm, you're just BS in stories? Well, I can BS in real life. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so... It, it, it's so crazy because uh, uh, the normal route is getting commercials, being on TV and movies. And then, but for you, it was go on to a react channel. So how did you even hear about an audition? I'm sure it was an audition for a react channel. Like improv where show. Did that come from? It was actually from an improv show I was doing. Okay. Um, I was 13 and it was, it was uh, the summer of 2011. Uh, and I was doing, was it summer 2011? I think it was summer 2011. Um, yeah, summer 2011. I was doing. Uh, I was at. An, I was doing my improv classes, and we had a show coming up. And at those classes, I actually ended up meeting someone who happened to be on Kids React at the time, who was also a pursuing actor. And his name is Landon Gailey. And he's not. I don't. Uh, he's not pursuing acting or any of that anymore, at least to my knowledge. Um, he and I fell out of touch years ago. But it was from him that I had learned about React because he was actually one of the kids on Kids React. And so, you know, me and him started talking and became friends. And then our parents talked and, you know, traded that information. And so months, you know, a couple months later, uh, just before I started school, uh, high school, uh, we saw the submission for React because there's a bunch of websites called like Casting Networks or LA Access where a lot of casting directors for non-union stuff would submit uh, or put out the uh, audition notices for audition so you could submit yourself. And so my mom saw the notice for Teens React and we were like, oh, we know what this is because we met that kid through the improv show. So she submitted me on that. And then in the typical sense, after you submit something, there's an audition and then people audition and then they pick whoever they want from their auditions, callbacks, so forth. Well, with React, because they were so new and they were bringing up a whole new series because originally they only had Kids React, but then they were bringing in the next generation Teens React. It, they just picked who they liked, and that's you. You got it. It was simple as that. You submitted on it. They looked through your picture. If they liked you, they pulled you in. And I just just so happened to be one of the people they picked. And so I, and it's super strange to think back to this because back in 2011 when we filmed this, the Fine Brothers, Benny and Rafi Fine, they were so still so new in the YouTube game, still trying to work, make it work. We were filming out of their apartment, so I was in their very first apartment, probably with both of them using one of their bedrooms that they had converted into the rooms we filmed the episode. So each different wall, like there's four walls in a room, each different wall was painted to fit whatever generation they were filming. So Kids React was painted on one wall and Teens React was painted on another wall. And then they would just move the set and the camera so it'd be facing that wall for that background. Yeah, so it was, creepy. it was, yeah, it was extremely, uh, <laughs> it was just really suspicious walking in and funnily enough, the very first person I ever met working at React was actually one of the most famous reactors coming out of uh, Fine Brothers, being uh, Leah Marie Johnson. And uh, she was the first person I ever met. And it was very just in passing because I was walking in as she was walking out. It was us just saying hello to each other. And then we walked through. And <laughs> it still cracks me up thinking about it. When we sit, sat down in what was their lobby was essentially like a pantry that had just taken everything out. They put a little couch in there and a TV for people to sit and wait. Super what the weird. hell? Yeah, super weird. And then there was a woman sitting in there that was like their receptionist, but you could tell she was not gonna stay there very long. How big was this that pantry? It was it was small. It was it was pretty much like a time. It was a small closet. It was pretty much a small closet. God. I just yeah, like it, if it was like the equivalent of a walk-in pantry, it was just a very small closet. Yeah, um Jesus. And then, huh. like, as they called me in to go into film, my mom just grabbed me by the shoulder and was just like if they try anything, you scream. And I was just like, okay, okay. I <laughs> like, mean, that's, I think, a, that's a fair, that's a fair, uh, no, 100 percent fair. It's 100 percent fair. But you know, uh, great things happened. Nothing, nothing bad happened. You know, I walked in, we filmed, it was good time. I laughed, had the had the fun, we left, and then you know, because we had pleasant experience, obviously kept coming back and we grew with the Fine Brothers and kind of watched how that whole situation blew up and became 
the, essentially the React dynasty on YouTube for a, a significant number of years. So that at, was wild to be a part of. At their height, I think they were racking like 130 million a month or something like that, views wise. Oh, easily. Easily. I, I, think, I think at least, yeah, they, it, that's insane. And you were on 300 videos. Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that not insane? <laughs> That, yeah, I often forget how many videos I'm actually in until someone brings it up. And I'm like, huh, oh yeah, yeah. I was in that. I gotta give a shout out, dude. I found all the, like a lot of this information on Fine Bros Wiki. So like you oh, can find information about every single person that's ever been <laughs> reacted. It's insane. Like, that's, I can post, I, that's wild. And it's linked to every video you're in. So it shows the list in each year. And then you just <laughs> click on that one and it'll send you right to the video. Yeah. That's why, like there's... Because I kept my head down so much working there, I didn't know half of this stuff existed. I didn't know there yeah. was a, a wiki. I didn't know there was like, I learned this through the other reactors that there's uh, like the, this like, a, oh, super weird. But there's a, a feet wiki and a lot of the react girls are on there for like feet pics that somebody had taken from like their Instagram or some shit. And I'm just like, what the fuck? And they're just like, yeah. yeah. And there's a, a whole Reddit of like this shit. And I'm like, Reddit huh? is a dangerous place. Huh? <laughs> I, I kept my head down so much. I was so unaware of any of this. I went in, filmed, did my thing, left. Yeah. So when when you were doing these, like um, obviously at the beginning, you said it was in their apartment. So then it was still Benny and Rafi like asking you the questions and stuff. So then how far into it did you get when it was like they had producers and they had their own studio? I would say it was two years before, was it two years? I would say maybe it was six months. It was probably closer to six months to a year before they got their first office, uh, like their first office. That is what we then started filming out of. And then after that, it was probably another two to three years before they got producers in that were the voices behind the camera that was not Benny and Rafi. So I would say the solid first solid three years that I was there, it was just Benny and Rafi behind the camera. Wow. Yeah, and then grow. after that, they grew big enough to where they would bring in producers and so on. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And I remember like um, it was a good like it was a good chunk of years that I remember it just specifically being then that are them. I don't remember exactly when it like switched over, but there was a good chunk that it was just the two of them talking to you guys for a while there. Oh, absolutely! Like it makes sense because they were they were trying to build a company, so they weren't hiring people; they were just going to do it themselves. Yeah, no, I mean, they did all the editing and everything else, the filming, the editing, everything. I mean, the the most common voice behind the camera back then was Benny. Benny was usually the one behind the table, you know, sifting through the papers, asking the questions and so on. And then Rafi would be sitting behind the camera, managing the camera, and then uh, occasionally adding in another question from behind the camera. And my goal was always just to make them laugh. Like, right. I didn't give a fuck what my reaction was. I just wanted to make them laugh. <laughs> it's funny actually because in, in your last ever video you said that it was uh try not to laugh and you're doing like versus people and you said my goal is to make the other person laugh that's the yeah. only thing i'm doing here yeah that's yeah. that's uh, whenever we paired when they paired us up the laugh challenges like because i knew the content they were going to show us would never make me laugh it, it almost never did and anytime i did laugh it was because it was something genuinely stupid enough to make me laugh or they were asking me to laugh because they did that a lot if because they're like hey we didn't get enough laughs or enough of this reaction for this video or so on so can you give us a laugh i'm like uh, sure and i would just laugh at any random thing but whenever they paired us up with somebody my goal was to make the other person laugh as much as possible like i wanted to make them lose not because I cared about losing, just because I thought it was fun if I got to make them laugh. I love that you're so good at the trying to laugh challenges that you had, you're told to laugh. That's how good you yeah. are. Yeah, they, they, they had to tell me to laugh, and then they had to tell me to stop making other people laugh. And I'm like, you're killing all the fun for me. Yeah, yeah seriously. Okay, so when you were doing these videos and you kept going on with it, how did they do it? Like, Did you sign a contract that you would like do a certain amount, or is like, you're going to keep coming back till we don't want you to come back again? Um, it was, it was pretty much that it was essentially on contract call and the way they would have it set up. And I'm pretty sure they had, still have it set up now. Cause I actually have a friend, uh, who started working there after I left. Um, so the way they would do it is they would usually do, uh, every week there'd be an email blast and they would send out an email blast with a questionnaire. And on that questionnaire would also ask for your availability for that week. And so on the questionnaire would be a variety of different topics about things they may or may not go over for an episode or just to give them a general idea of what kind of cast they may want for an episode. And then after you answered all those questions at the bottom would say, OK, what would be your availability for these dates or for this week? And then you'd put up your availability saying I'm available for 
I can film at this time, but only in the afternoon or this time in the morning, or I'm available all day, so on and so forth. Um, and their filming hours are generally from 9 a.m. to about 5 or 6 p.m. And that's generally how they would do the casting, at least after they had an established office and producers and so on. Otherwise, it was just, hey, come in, you're filming. It's like, okay. So it was more often than not always just on call. There was no set amount, hey, you're filming this number. Because there would be times you'd come in, you'd film two videos, you'd be done. And then there'd be other times you'd come in, you'd be filming five videos that day. And so they'd pretty much use you the entire time and then you'd be done. And then after they, let's say you did a five video day, they wouldn't call you in for a month because they stockpiled all the videos of you. And then they'll just release them week to week to week to week until they feel they need to bring you in again. When you do the ones with like five videos, would you like come with a change of clothes so it didn't look like you never changed over? Like oh, weeks? literally they would say come with multiple outfits. Really? Or yeah, in my sense, case, you don't want to look like you don't change. Exactly. And in, and in my case, because, you know, I was, I was a guy, I didn't bring multiple outfits. I would just bring different t-shirts. And you'd only saw, you know, this yeah. much anyway. So That's it was just like, all right, let me change shirt. Okay, yeah. there's an outfit change. All right, let me change shirt. All right, there's an outfit change. So some people would bring whole outfits. And like some of the women would bring whole outfits, change makeup, change their entire outfit and everything. And then I would say this is probably the case with most of the guys. We would just bring <laughs> multiple t-shirts. That's what I would do, 100%. T-shirts. Because I would so, have I would have the same thing or same thought pattern as you is like, I'm not standing up. You're not seeing my bottom half. I'm gonna change my shirt. Exactly. Like yeah. that's that's what the vast majority of guys did. We would just change shirts. And then some of the women, some of the women would just, you know, go to the bathroom, change shirt, and come back. Some of them would change their entire outfit. And I'm just like, seems like a lot of work, but okay, sure, do you? Seriously, yeah. Were you ever like when you were like in the middle of these? So you did it from 2011 to 2020. Correct. In in the middle of this, were you ever thinking like I don't want to do it anymore? I was like, when you, you <laughs> want to do, it, you're like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'm not coming back. Like, how does that work? So because it's on contract, you could pretty much say you didn't want to work anymore whenever you wanted. And for me, it was around my seventh year working with them, where I was just like, yeah, I'm not sure how much longer I want to do this. And that solely became because the content, from my opinion started going downhill it was getting dumber and dumber and dumber and i'm like why the fuck am i doing this like i specifically and i'm friends with the producer who even made this episode which is fun, fucking hilarious but my <laughs> least favorite episode that i ever filmed was called is it blue or does it taste blue and it was a it was a food challenge it wasn't even a challenge it was just them handing us random blue colored food and asking us if that blue food if that food tasted blue like they would hand us like blue color Gatorade. Does this taste blue? And I'm like, this is fucking Gatorade. This isn't blue. And of course the person sitting next to me goes, yeah, no, this tastes blue. And I'm like, are you what? what? Like I would just be losing my mind at this. Like how, first off, this is a drink. You can't taste the color. That's part of the light spectrum. You see it. And then they would hand us like something that was uh, a gummy that was blue raspberry flavored. And they'd be like, does this taste blue? And every time I'm like, no, this doesn't taste fucking blue. And the person next to me would be like, yeah, this is blue. I um, would literally say no every single time. It doesn't matter what color it was. It doesn't, you can't taste colors. That's so stupid. It, yeah, it was pissing me off. It was I pissing never, me off. And the producers were loving it because they wanted to make me mad. Right. But the, and the person next to me just kept saying it tasted blue. I, could, I was just getting more and more pissed. I'm like, you can't taste a fucking color. Were they and, joking? Like, were they playing oh, it up? The, the producers were 100%. They, no, they were joking. Was well, the, the, or the person beside me, no, they weren't joking. They were literally like, no, yeah, this could taste blue. And I'm like, and if you go and watch the episode, there are other people throughout the fucking episode that go, yeah, no, I can see how this tastes blue. And I'm like, that's not how this works. I watch, I used to watch oh. so many of these videos, like I mentioned before, and I never saw this one. The second we were done this, I'm going to go watch that because that sounds so stupid. It was so dumb. I got to see your reaction to that, which is so funny because it's literally it, what the video is about. It was, it was pissing me off so much. And then I think, I don't remember if it was that same day or the next time I came in to film, but the next one I thought that was really stupid that I filmed. Well, again, one of the final straws that made me go, yeah, I'm not sure how much longer I want to stay here was, is it soup? Yeah, yeah. It's like is what? It soup? Like, are they trying to like cereal soup? Like, what is that? What yeah, they're... it was like they give us a bowl of cereal. Is it soup? Or they'd give us something that may or may not be a soup. And they're like, it's like, for example, someone didn't know gazpacho was a soup. So they handed us a, a bowl of gazpacho and they're like, is it a soup? I'm like, yes, this is clearly a soup. This is gazpacho. And the person next to me was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I've never heard of this. So I don't know if it's a soup. And I'm just like, the fuck? <laughs> I just said what it's called and that it is a soup. And you're saying you don't know if it's a soup, even though I just said this? Oh, my God. 
I, I like that again, some of the stupidest episodes I've ever filmed that genuinely made me go, yeah, I don't know if I still want to keep working here. Oh, and then God. what made me stay, the only thing that made me stay was go, eh, I kind of want to hit that 10 year marker just to say I've been there for 10 years. Only reason I stuck and, around for as long as I did. And, and it's funny because um, you just so happened to like, I don't know how media you you chose to leave, but like you hit 300 on the dot, which is a really cool milestone as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was, that's pretty funny, actually. I never thought that, but that, yeah, I mean, I, I like, those were the two episodes when I was like seven, seven and a half years in where I was like, yeah, I'm not sure how much longer, longer I want to keep working here. This, right. this the content we're doing is getting years. stupider and stupider. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Sam Pack Construction. I'm probably the least handiest person I know. And by probably, I mean, I am the least handiest person I know, but that's where Sam Pack Construction comes in. From construction management to framing to back framing to renovations, fencing and decking to custom builds, they literally do it all. They offer services through the GTA and surrounding areas. You can email them today at sampatconstruction at live.ca to book their services. Again, that is sampatconstruction at live.ca. Um, so like most companies, um, I feel like the fine bros wanted to show that they had like that family mentality Were there other reactors that like you were really good friends with that. Like you would always hang out with and stuff, or was it kind of like a lone wolf kind of thing? That's a unique question. I like that question. And I would and I say that because they're at least within the reactors, they're tr they at least tried to develop a sense of community because a lot of the reactors did, some of them did uh, befriend one another and try to hang out and stuff. I myself was very much the, using your words, the lone wolf, because I didn't go out of my way to try to befriend any of the reactors, whether we were working together on set or we were just chilling, sitting in the lobby. I was always friendly or it'd be nice, but I never really clicked with any of them like that to be friends with them to that fashion. So like, you know, always politely and respectfully got along with these folks, but nobody i ever immediately clicked with to become friends some of them i got along with better than others but for the most part very much stayed within myself and i never really resonated with anyone too much to become really more than just acquaintances with them so i would say amid some of the reactors absolutely some of them are still really tight friends some of them are even best friends now and are roommates with each other i myself have always been kind of the odd one out in that fashion always kind of kept to myself never really got along with anyone well enough to try to be friends with them. So I just kind of kept my head down, ignored any drama, or quite frankly, because I kept my head down and minded my business so much, I wasn't even aware of drama until later. Yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll get to that. That was uh, interesting to learn about later going, wait, what the fuck, this was going on? Yeah. So yeah, no, I was very much the lone wolf at React, at least from my perspective. It, it, it might be a silly question because like you were so into it that you wouldn't have seen it the same way like other people would. But like when you'd be in the lobby waiting with like around with other creators, did it kind of feel like a TV show where like other cartoon characters like who never have seen together scenes together, like all of a sudden had a scene together. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you feel like actually, yeah. Ray Johnson and like um, Marley sitting beside each other, but you never saw them other times. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, there's definitely been plenty of cases where because also the generations were often split. I would see uh, there'd be like people so like, let's say I had moved up to college kids react. So I was with the, the older generation, but I'd be chilling in the lobby and I'd see like, Oh, there's Jacob from teens react or kids react. It's like, Oh, there's um, um, Jackson from kids react. It's like, and then we would chill, have a, a very nice conversation in the lobby and then we'd go off and film and never see each other again. Right. So there's plenty. So yeah, there was plenty of moments like that where it would just get loud and rambunctious, very TV show, like in the lobby of just like, Oh yeah, I haven't seen you in a while. It's like, Oh, I we, we haven't worked together in like X amount of months. And it would be very TV show ish in that regard. And then it would immediately dissipate as we all had to go film in separate rooms. And then one of us would film finish before the other and end up leaving the studio before the other. So we just wouldn't see or connect beyond that. See, correct me if I'm wrong, but like it took a little bit until they started actually like combining people together. Like for a mm -hmm. long time there, they were by themselves. Right. So like for you, was that like, because it was new where you're like, Oh, this is actually kind of sick. Like I actually got someone beside me. I can talk with instead of just like Benny who's behind the camera. One of the producers behind the camera. And that must've been like, hey, this is kind of cool actually. I, it was, it was interesting for me because my goal is like, all right, I'm just going to instigate the fuck out of the person next to me. <laughs> like how much can I gaslight the person next to me just yeah. to get to react? Because that's what it came. I turned it into a game for myself. So it became a little more fun for me when I had somebody to interact with. So yeah, I would say it was pretty cool. 
Because, you know, doing it by yourself and bouncing off the producers can be pretty fun. But when you have someone who's sitting directly next to you, that can be either super against your opinion or they can also agree with your opinion. It's really nice to have that energy next to you to bounce off of. So, yeah, it was it was pretty cool when they started introducing the the two pairs and doing episodes like that, for sure. And then that's the other thing as well, because, like, if you're trying to get a reaction out of someone, it's that much better that everyone else is seeing it. It's not yes. just seeing yes. like, like, the joke for yourself, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because like I would crack a joke and the producers would laugh, but sometimes it wouldn't make the episode or they would uh, they would edit it out versus when I'm actively making the person sit next to me laugh. That's something that they can grab on camera that would be more inclined for them to actually put into an episode because right. there's plenty of editing where they try to guide a certain direction or make someone look a certain way. Uh, but whenever I had somebody next to me, like 100 percent, my goal was to try to bounce off of them and try to get any kind of reaction I could out of just messing with the person next to me. See, it's funny you mentioned it, but like sometimes they try to guide you in a certain way or they edit shit out because there was that viral clip that came out last year from Josh and Troy, two reactors. I just, a couple of things that they said I'll, I'll, that I wrote down. Mm -hmm. Josh said, fuck the fine bros. <laughs> they couldn't speak their minds. They were on your dick in balls. And if there was a good, and um, if they did speak their mind, there was a good chance they weren't in the video. So what, when you saw that, like, was it like passed around through creators? You just saw it on your own. What was your way of seeing it? Well, it's interesting that you say that because so with Josh, I would say Josh's situation was a little unique. Um, to my knowledge, he actually made one of the producers cry and that's why he didn't get brought back. Right. Yeah. He, uh, he made like a gun, uh, a gun. Uh, yes there and that that was that actually was later so first there was uh on one of the episodes i don't remember what it was but he made one of the producers behind the camera cry while they were filming one of the episodes and not not in a and like a sad like oh he said something so emotional like he was being a dick mm -hmm. and made them cry and then later made a joking gun threat to vidcon and then he got banned from vidcon and i'm like you don't you don't whatever yeah. um anyway so i just thought that was an interesting decision now and that's probably why uh josh had the aggressive tone towards the fine brothers is just because uh he was being himself they didn't appreciate it so they didn't bring him back and kicked him off um but i will agree with the fact that they did edit a lot of the stuff we said i won't say they didn't allow us to say what we wanted because that is not true mm -hmm. you could speak as freely as you wanted i always said what was on my mind always mm -hmm. now how, a lot of that stuff get cut absolutely a lot of that stuff got cut out there was sometimes i'd even throw in jokes in there that i knew were a little outlandish just to see if i could make them land in the episode more often than not they didn't so excuse me uh more often than not they didn't but i there were still times where i would try to get a joke that was a little more out there to see if i get like there was one episode we were watching to where <laughs> to where i said what what the fuck is this? Am, am i having a fucking stroke right now what is this <laughs> I solely said that to see if I could get a reaction out of the producer to see if I can make it into the episode. I got a reaction out of the producer and he was fucking uncomfortable. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you weren't in the episode? Perfect, but it did not make the episode. Did not make I the episode. Fucking stroke. So, you know, there was plenty of things where they got cut out and they didn't let them make the episode for one reason or another. But they, at least for me, they never stopped me from saying what I wanted to say. Now, they right. would, after I said what I wanted to say, they would ask a a kind of guiding question to try to put you in a direction with an answer. But I would always stand firmly on my ground and go, no, blah, blah, blah. Right. No, like why? No, it's like, and it's like, oh, but what about this? I'm like, I just gave you my opinion on this. It's that. So, right. and the producers actually had to learn that with me, they couldn't do guided questions mm -hmm. because I would stand so firmly on my opinion on what I just said. And I knew this because whenever they would come in with a new producer, um, more often than not, producers said, oh, yeah, they told talked to me about you. And I was like, oh, yeah, what they say? Yeah, because I, I stand so firmly on my opinion. I'm not going to I'm not going to go with some guided thing. I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah. Hey, can you say this for this reason? I'm like, no, I'm going to say what my opinion is. Now, my opinion would generally be in line with what they wanted. It would just come off so bluntly. It made it seem more aggressive than it actually was. But that's just also how I kind of speak. I'm just very off the riff, not going to sugarcoat anything, say what's on my mind. And that's either going to piss you off or you're going to appreciate it. It's right. And, 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 that, and that's what Troy said in the video was that like they, they guided you to an answer. Clearly not everybody, you, not, not everybody, everybody did. let yeah. that happen. And, and did you ever find yourself like 
um, in videos, like, and you weren't even like trying to be like blunt or try to be funny to see, to get a reaction to see if you wouldn't be in it. There were there times you were just being you and you're like, that's weird. I, I think I should have been in this episode or I think. Absolutely. I like, yeah. So like, and like, Absolutely. You, ever have, like you ever like complain about that or no? No, nah, I knew because no. I, I never complained because I knew the situation I was in because it's coming from my entertainment background. I was already so aware of reality TV and how it's filmed, how it's used. They're going to cut it and guide it to whatever direction they want to get whatever kind of reaction they want from their audience. So yeah. I never complained because I knew the system. I right. understood how react because that's all react was. It was reality TV. It was reality TV with reaction based content. You, the reality is the reactions and opinions of the folks you're watching based on their opinions of the content that they're being shown. So in my head, I always looked at it as a reality TV show. So I was never upset when they cut anything because I knew that's how it functioned. In reality TV, they always try to guide it to make one person look like the villain. Even if what they did wasn't that bad, reality TV will edit it or shoot it to make it look like it's much worse than it actually is to create that animosity and that tension for the TV show because that keeps with the audience attached. And that's 100% what went on with React. They're guiding audience opinion based on how they edit and put in uh, certain reactors and their opinions. And they may not even line up the opinion with that question. They may cut it so it's a different question that it sounds like they're answering versus what they actually said in regards to that topic. Did you hear other reactors at the time complaining about the whole guided question thing? Uh, no, nobody at the time, at least in my, while I was there, nobody, as far as I'm aware, complained about it. I don't think anyone, at least I never thought anyone cared. Clearly people did. But the majority of people I feel like that complained also generally had the more controversial opinion, so they weren't seen as often. My, right. I can't necessarily say my opinion was always controversial. It was more often I was just always super blunt. Mm -hmm. So that you know could come off as controversial or as aggressive. So I think that's probably why you know a lot of my stuff got cut, but at the same time, they used me more often than not as the villain. They try to guide me in the direction is like, okay, this is the guy who doesn't like anything and then here's everybody else who generally likes everything and that's right. how i was often used but i had no problem with that because i that knew you. that's how they were going to use me and i honestly enjoyed it 100 percent. so um coming from that video the uh, the one the other thing they had mentioned which kind of pissed me off just like how they talked about it, was about leah marie so mm -hmm. obviously with mm -hmm. leah marie she was like one of the ogs i'm pretty sure she was in the first video yes if, she was yeah. so she was in about i think it was reacting to viral videos Mm -hmm. kids sure react to viral videos yep that's what it was so um i mean just like just to mention like i remember watching it and me and her are the same age like we're both 96 and i remember having the biggest crush on her man and she was on it for a lot like not a lot oh of yeah time, but like a lot of videos like she was in maybe not every single one but a lot of them and oh, so yeah. she obviously had her 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 problems and her troubles so you i know you had mentioned like how you saw her like that first day and stuff did you ever talk to her during that stuff so because Leah had the status that she had, she and I really only had that, like when it comes to pleasant interactions, that was probably yeah. the only pleasant interaction we had. And I don't mean that uh, by like Leah's a bad person or she's not nice or anything because she definitely is. But because we were so young and we were in the entertainment, something that's common in the entertainment industry is kids get a big head. Kids get a really big head. Their ego gets inflated. They're like, oh, I'm on TV. Everybody sees me. Look at all these people coming to look at me. And that's part of what happened to Leah. She got pulled in and sucked into the whole Hollywood side of it. Got a really big head. So after that first interaction of her and I just pleasantly saying hi and passing, anytime she and I had an interaction, which wasn't often, it was very few and far between, she was always kind of snotty and stuck up about it because she had this elevated sense of self because of her ego, because of entertainment, which, you know, is extremely common, especially for younger folk. And depending on what their background is, if they don't have a grounding, uh, you know, if their parents aren't super grounding, helping keeping them down to earth and, you know, hey, you're still a person, you don't, doesn't matter what kind of status you have. Like, I don't think, based on how she acted, I'm not sure if she was getting that, couldn't say. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I know the one extended interaction that I tried to have with her was back when we were filming the React to that TV show. Uh, on Nickelodeon and um, we, she and I were sitting chilling in the green room and this was coincidental because she and I hadn't been sitting together alone ever mm -hmm. and there was always somebody else there or like a parent or mm -hmm. another reactor so there's always more than more than one person but it was just she and I and I was like yo and I genuinely was like yo what's up Leah and then she was just like Tch! and like scoffed at me and looked at her phone and I was like okay 
Like, I'm just trying to be nice and have a pleasant conversation. We've seen each other in passing. We don't know each other at all. We both work for the same company trying to be nice. And she was very full of herself. And I was like, all right, shit, guess I won't have to try to have a conversation with you. And then later when we were filming, literally filming together on set, for some reason, it felt like I was the only one she had anything against. And I didn't understand why, <laughs> like, you know, we're being playful and nice to everybody else. And then when it came to me, she was just like, Ugh. and I was like, bro, what did I do? Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> so, that's so weird. And did, did you was, ever find out the reason for that? Never found out. No, I never knew why she had such an attitude towards me, but I was just like, I, I was ever the type of person to hold on to or get upset by those things. So I just kind of blew it off. I was like, all right, whatever you're yourself. Cool. Yeah. And just kept interacting with everybody else. And then later down the line, hearing the hearing the unfortunate news of what she's been going through, like, and I didn't hear it from her. I didn't hear it from other reactors. I actually first heard of it from the fan base. It oh, was the yeah. fan base who messaged me saying, hey, this stuff is going on with Leah. Can you do something about it? And I'm like, what kind of relationship do these people think we have with right. each other? Like, I don't know these people like that. And then when more, you know, unfortunate news was unfolding and some um, NSFW uh, photographs of Leah were leaked, I had no knowledge of it, but the fan base, for whatever reason, felt the need to send them to me. And I'm like, bro, whoa, I didn't need to see this. I don't look at Leah like that. Why are you sending me this? Like, I don't I don't need to see this stuff. And it was it was, I felt so bad for her. I'm like, man, I, I understand the Hollywood thing so much, so well. And seeing her essentially fall down that spiral of the child star that kind of falls from grace. That was, that was surreal to see from someone that I personally had known and worked with, despite, you know, not having the most positive relationship. I was still surreal scenes like, oh, shit, not only does this happen like on TV and the news with all these big celebrities that you hear about, but even the niche Internet celebrities like that. So it was it was wild hearing that. And me and Leah never had that kind of friendly relationship. So there was no, you know, me reaching out to her, seeing if she was OK. I could only hope for the best that she would, you know, get better and, you know, find her way out of this rut. It, it was she it did was, finally. Yes, yeah, she did. She definitely yeah. did. And I applaud her for that. But holy crap, it was wild watching it, literally watching it all unfold in real time oh, with dude, people sending it to me. Dude, dude, she was like on like those Instagram lives and stuff. She was yeah. Were, yeah. Were insane, man. Like she would be in like like trap houses and like crack like crack houses, actually like actually crack houses. Yeah. Not even like a joke or anything. Like she the, she was in the middle of that stuff. Like she when she came back, I think it was last year with like saying, Hey, like I I'm I'm better now. She was saying she had been to jail, rehab a psych war she lived on the street it's like it's crazy what fame can do to someone that's like not in that industry that never grew up with it also yeah. like, dude she was in the movie she had that movie with cameron dallas who was like one of the biggest internet stars at the time so it's like mm -hmm. when that happens it's like that's this shit's bound to happen it's bound to happen especially if you allow yourself to get sucked into the whole hollywood stardom which really honestly more often than not will pull you into the bad crowd of hollywood that is or i say hollywood but of the internet i guess or of hollywood too just within the entertainment industry that you're more inclined to get pulled into that if you allow yourself to get sucked in to the stardom and the fame and all the ego and all that stuff and i think based on just watching what was happening with her just as a kid i think that's what happened with her she got pulled in she got sucked into the whole hollywood stardom the fame the celebrity and she reaped the benefits, but also, you know, sowed her own problems, which she experienced. Yeah. And I, again, I can only applaud her for being able to pull herself out and get better, but watching it happen, it was, I'm honestly surprised that it didn't happen to more of the react. Yeah. Folk, but at the same time, I don't think anyone was as big as Leah was. No, like, dude, like I think it was like, right after she was on React. You, she had like the awesomeness TV. Mm -hmm. She had her own YouTube channel, which had hundreds of thousands of subscribers. It's like she had everything all at once and so quick. So yeah, it is surprising that it didn't happen to anyone else the way it did with her. Right. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's a wild industry to be working. In, I can tell you, say that much. Seriously, and you're you're just like to me, you're just so lucky that like you have that knowledge and that background of like what can happen so you were always yeah. around it, right so yeah i was always super aware and if anything it to my uh demise i guess all right i guess demise isn't really uh uh the right word but 
to to my lack of foresight as a teenager being in that situation because i was so aware of it i was against the title or any recognition that i received so i was against the title of celebrity influencer youtuber any of that stuff i pushed that stuff away like that's probably part of the reason why my social media has always been very sparse in its postings whether it be months apart or years apart was because I was so against the celebrity status. I thought it was weird that I would get thousands of likes on an Instagram photo. I'm like, why? I don't know any of you people. What mm -hmm. reason do you have to follow me? I don't do anything entertaining. I'm just a teenager. Yeah. And I constantly pushed away the status and title of being an internet celebrity or any of that for so many years that if I capitalized on it when I was a teenager, the, uh, I probably would be in a, in a more elevated state within the whole atmosphere of content creators and the internet celebrity versus, you know, me coming back to it almost 10 years later or, you know, trying to be more relevant for lack of a better word and presence within social media and on the internet. It's, it's interesting coming back and seeing that despite my lack of acceptance of it as a teenager and me accepting it now as an adult and still having people recognize me like you or, anyone else like just walking around TwitchCon and having people go, Oh my God, you're that guy. And I was like, you remember me <laughs> is super. I, I don't think that's something I will ever get used to is getting recognized. I mean, that, to is, be honest, that is super strange. You may just be a little bit taller and your, your, your hair is a little shorter. That's to me, that's the biggest difference between the <laughs> first video and now, like literally like your hair was a little bit higher and your, your voice was a little higher as well. But like, to me, you're <laughs> really the same. I mean, you I always try to, you know, that, that was, I guess I achieved my goal, which is being as consistent as possible, just being myself, not being any fake internet persona. So, uh, I guess I achieved that bit. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's wild to me still having people recognize me. Like when I traveled, uh, in 2017 and was visiting a friend over in Australia, I was just like, yeah, nobody's going to recognize me out here. Right. It's Australia. Like this isn't the U S blah, blah, blah. But what didn't click was the fact that Australia is still a natively English speaking country. They will still see natively English speaking content on YouTube or wherever other parts of the internet. Right. That didn't click to me when I was traveling and visiting my friend out there. And he and I were just casually walking down the street going, we were going to go to the, the local fish and chips place. And some person was walking the opposite direction of us. You know, we're minding our business, having a conversation. They immediately just look over at me. We just casually end up meeting eyes. They go, hi, Ethan, and keep walking. And I just go, huh? <laughs> Did you say my name? They, they, I was just like, what? They just they said it so casually to like they knew me. And it threw me off. And they're like, hey, can I get a picture? I was like, yeah, sh sure. And they just took a selfie, thanks, and then kept walking. And I was like, that was probably one of the coolest and most casual interactions I have ever had with a random person on the street. That is so weird. What the it hell? Super wild. And I still don't think I'll ever get used to it. No matter where I go, if I'm in an area where we're, I'm in an area with people that are within our age range, and I'm like, there's probably somebody here who recognizes me. And more often than not, there's at least one to three that say hi or want to grab a picture. And I'm like, yeah, okay. This is yeah. still so weird. Like I that is, that is definitely that. something I don't think I'll ever get used to. Well, it is. I'm telling you the only, the only difference was between your first episode and your last episode, you had some braces for a little bit there. Other than <laughs> that, man, there, there wasn't much difference. <laughs> yeah, right. That baby so, face is going to stick with me. That's yeah, for sure. dude, I, I, I used to have the same problem or I guess still have the same problem. Um, so in the middle, I think it was a couple years before you left Define bro started having some controversy. Right. The first one was the trademark. Mm -hmm. They tried to trademark the word react in the company. Just being a guy that was on camera. What was that like being in the middle of it? Was there much like knowledge for you? Yes and no. Yes, because I heard about it in uh, one of our. So they would do a yearly get together with because the, they were trying to do the react family thing and they would do a yearly get together with the producers and the administration and the cast and try to get everybody be friendly with every uh, everyone and so on. And it was at one of those that they had brought up the React world, React trademark thing. And because I had an understanding of that, having worked in entertainment with the dad working corporate legal and having seen those contracts, I already had a frame of reference for what they were trying to do. At first, based on how they presented it to us, I didn't think it was a bad idea. I thought, oh, yeah, they just want to trademark React the way that it's written for them to trademark their company, so on and so forth. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And then later it came out, 
oh, it was like reactionary content, I was like, oh, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Everybody reacts to everything just by looking at something. Just because you don't have an immediate facial expression, you still have a mental reaction. Mm -hmm. So you react to something like, and trying to control that, I'm like, and then they tried to break it down to elaborate. It's like, no, just the way we do it, our format, so on. I'm like, okay, I can see how you want to do it with your specific format. But at the same time, there's other people who were doing this before you mm -hmm. and there are still larger creators like ellen degeneres who they tried to come after who will do it aside from you because you're not big enough to be relevant to them no so it was super interesting seeing it from the little bit that i had thought they were doing versus what they were actually doing and then seeing it all for and i when i saw their video come out i was like oh this is a bad idea it it's happened a bad idea. so quick. They had the video announcing what they were doing. Then they had an apology. Then they came with a video apologizing. But their video that they were apologizing, they were just mad. Like they yeah, were, they mad. were like, they're they're like really mad at people watching the video. It's like that's not how you apologize. You don't get mad <laughs> as you're apologizing. So like they, they, that video, they were they were mad because people didn't get it. Right. <laughs> like, because of the and way I'm they like, you can't it. apologize, hey, you're sorry, but be mad while you're saying sorry. Because yeah. then you're not actually saying sorry. No. It was... Uh, it made zero sense. And I, I got this information here that the the original way that they're going to trademark it and everything like that, the deal, like the deals that they're getting was 50% of anyone's brand deals that do reactions and 60% of the rev share. And you couldn't post on Facebook without their permission. Yeah, they were they were good creatives. They were bad businessmen, yeah. to put it simply. Yeah. Because oh, I like that. Yeah, their creative ideas were generally pretty decent. And, you know, that React was at its height with their creative ideas. But at the same time, all of the business decisions they were making were what started their downfall. And it only snowballed. Mm -hmm. And as just one of the cast members there, I only saw so much of it. Right. I pretty much just saw all the internet backlash of it and them stepping back. And then I was after that too, to where I felt like I started seeing them less and less in the studio. And they're more just in the offices, not participating, being part of the creative side, just focusing on business decisions with, I don't remember if it was Benny or Rafi that was CEO. And then the other one was COO. And they were doing all of the administrative business work until they eventually handed it off to do focus more on creative but by then, it had already fallen so much business-wise, at least looking back now, that uh, it was, it's, it's, just, it's a really hard thing to say without having much more information on it. Because a lot more of the information I have is more in regards to the producers interacting with the cast and what producers had to do and editors had to do versus what they thought they should do because it was what the Fine Brothers wanted versus what their editors and producers thought they should do. And also uh, hindsight 2020, it's like there was so much going on that like it was probably harder to see it all and know it all being on the inside because like, oh yeah, probably gonna have to tell people like the people telling you it's not that big of a deal. It's not this, it's not that, right? Like they're probably, they're probably trying to downplay it, I, I would assume. I mean, they definitely try to downplay it more internally. The mm -hmm. cast only really what because the cast wasn't really involved with the internal decision making. More often than not, we learned through social media or we learned through someone's YouTube video. When it came with the producers, uh, so and again, I didn't learn this later till I was working at Newegg. Um, but the Fine Brothers did not want the producers or the editors or anyone working behind the scenes to get friendly or become friends with any of the React cast. Because the Fine Brothers' worry was if the editors or producers who chose to leave, that they would take the cast with them. And so it created this hard line between whether or not you even got to know it. Like, because there was... So okay, the turnover rate of Fine Brothers was actually pretty high. Oh, yeah? In regards to producers. Uh, I saw cycling of so many different producers, and there were a select few that ended up sticking around for a few years. But more often than not, they, they flipped and cycled through producers pretty quickly. And it wasn't until later lear learning about the work environment there as to why that was happening so much. It was a pretty toxic work environment and they wanted just snappy, quick, co constant push of content, not even something that necessarily the producers were happy about making. They were just making it to get content out. And that's part of what I want to say when I started saying uh, like the seven year marker, when I said like, is it blue or whatever, that was very much part of that content downfall. And it was progressively getting worse and worse. And 
that's when you start to notice producers and stuff leaving. And I was also just like, oh, where's, I haven't seen this person in a few months. I wonder where they went. And then I would learn, it's like, oh, they left. And I'm like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And, and, then when, and once you see a few leave, you, you, that's when you think they, there's clearly something, a problem. Or oh, yeah, wrong. definitely. And it wasn't until one of them that I'd only worked with one time uh, was lead, just so happened to be leaving on her last day as I was coming in. She was there for like two, maybe three months. And uh and she was like yeah you don't want to work here and i was like uh, and i was like what really and she's like no if you're doing what you're doing you're fine but you do not want to work here and i was like okay and she's like just trust me and i was like all right i gotta take your word for it and then you know she, we we walked our separate ways and my day was you know as per normal shooting but it always but ever since that interaction made me think man what the fuck goes on behind the scenes that i don't see and lo and behold, all the stuff that comes out later, it's just like, oh, shit. So that's what was going on. Yeah. And that was the other thing I wanted to mention. So the I, I don't I think you were still there when that the old video came out of Benny when he was in blackface. Uh, so his blackface video came out in 2008. And sorry, yeah, like, sorry, res like resurfaced. Right. Yeah. It resurfaced in 2020 during the Black Lives Matter movement, actually. Right, and, and you le and you left that June. I did. I did. I actually was one of the last or one of the last people to leave. And part of that was because I wanted to see how they handled the situation. It was handled poorly. It was your typical corporate. Oh, yeah, we're sorry, blah, blah, blah. So it wasn't it wasn't genuine. It didn't sound like it came from the Fine Brothers. It sounded like it came from a lawyer. Um, but yeah, I didn't know about the, any of that content. I didn't know about the pedophilia content until after. And it was and the pedophile content they were making while I was working there. Like I didn't know that. Yeah. They made, yeah. They made that while I was like all the hey Millie stuff. Like they made that while I was working there and I didn't even know. And, and it it's weird to think they did that when they had kids react. Yeah, and, and I know we were joking about it earlier about like how like they did in their apartment and stuff, but it makes it that much weirder that they're doing that hey Millie shit in their apartment. You know well, I mean? and, and then the kids there. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't know if they're doing hey Millie. I don't remember what year the Hey Millie stuff came out, if they were doing that within their apartment or whatever. But when I was heard that that stuff was coming out, what was wild to me was they have content where it's very pedophilic and then they work with kids on a regular basis. Something doesn't sound right here. No. Um, and then, so you did, you were part of that Black Lives Matters, Matters video. Correct. So, and then that was... I think you did, I think a couple, not maybe, I, that was probably the last one you'd film, but a couple more came out that you were in. So what was your ultimate decision of like, okay, you know what? I know, I know you said like how they would handle it, but did you talk to other, like, cause that video, man, it, like, of course mm -hmm. it was all people of color. So after that, did you speak to other people of color, like Kennedy or anybody else saying like, Hey, what do you, what's your opinion? What are you going to do? Or did you kind of just decide on your own? I'm done. Um, so I didn't actually ask for any of their opinions, quite frankly, with that stuff come out, that was the nail in the coffin for a lot of them. So a lot of them just straight up left. Um, I was already thinking about leaving, you know, uh, for a while. I just, again, was just like, Hey, I'll get to the 10 year marker. Uh, that was literally just my opinion. I was like, I'll get to 10 years and then I'll leave. But after seeing that stuff, I was like, man, just from even from a moral standpoint, I don't feel like I should stick around. But I'm curious to see how they'll handle the situation. I hadn't talked to anyone. It was very much my decision. And if I had talked with any of them, I probably would have left sooner than I did. Um, but I very much just wanted to see how they would handle it. I wanted to watch everything unfold while still being there before I was like, all right, I'm going to leave. So, yeah, for me, it was very much just I was observational and I didn't I didn't talk with anyone about it. And with the Black Lives Matter video, too, fun fact, they weren't originally going to pay us for that. They wanted to just use our stories, and that's it. That's all they want. They want to be able to use our stories and not pay us for that. I didn't learn that until later, talking with one of the producers and one of the editors, that they're like, oh, yeah, they weren't planning to pay you guys for that. And I was like, wow, that's even more fucked. Wow. They just wanted to use us for free money. Cool. So, yeah, no, it, it only made it that much worse. And I was just like, Damn. That's super fucked. They there, didn't want to pay us for our stories. And there's been claim, there was claims that came out like and, and or, yes. Um, did you ever um, experience yourself or or did you hear about it like like word to mouth or did, was it just kind of like like you said your head was down you weren't part of those things you know what I mean? Um, I I I think I, yeah I very much kept my head down enough that uh, it was I kind of dodged a lot of that stuff i i kept my head down and minded my own business for so much that hearing all the stuff later was almost a shock to me 
that like that's how unaware of it i was so yeah it was it was very it was a weird situation it was really weird like and especially hearing again hearing other people's stories coming out going oh shit it was that bad for you because sometimes it was even some of the react cast members that had received some uh unpleasant interactions with some people behind the scenes not even just off camera and you know from people on the internet and they weren't getting support and i was just it was wild hearing all of these things that i didn't experience because my my general genuine experience there was just so pleasant the majority of the time like i had a great time with everybody right. the producers and the other cast members and like internet backlash i expected just for how i acted on the show so i was never phased by any of it but seeing how affected a lot of my fellow cast members were it, it was really disheartening to see it was really disheartening to see in here that that was the situation that they all had to deal with and i was just kept my head down minding my business totally unaffected and i was like oh damn i didn't even realize it was that bad so right. I mean, yeah and, it was and i'm sure th i'm sure they did a they tried to do a good job of hiding it as much as i could too right? absolutely absolutely i mean they definitely hid plenty because there's plenty of things again i wasn't aware of until years later or like things that happened with kennedy or um some of the other reactors i was like oh shit this was going on while i was there jesus <laughs> and i didn't hear about any of it until later but i don't know if that was because i kept my head down or if that's because they were just so good at at keeping it all hidden swept under the covers Right. Yeah. And then, and then but yeah, they still try it would play off that family mentality shit, man. That's such yeah. bullshit. <laughs> yeah, they would. Um, I got two more things before I let you go. Your ultimate opinion today of Benny and Rafi, what would what would that be? I wish they were better people. Okay. Because growing up with them the way I did for so long, for so many years, I thought they were the dopest people. They were mm -hmm. just these two chill, short dudes that were always super nice with me and fun to work with and always seemed super pleasant when i was with them on set and just seeing them through the office and then hearing everything come out about them from the blackface content to the pedophilic content to how they treated their staff it was it was it was it was upsetting honestly like i was like damn i genuinely thought these people were super dope and chill and then lo and behold how they're treating staff and how they're treat uh, and this content they've made in the past like I, I I never would have imagined that they were as um, frustrating people as they turned out to be, and right. so they, it was it was just unfortunate learning that. So I wish they were better. I wish they were the people that I thought they were in my head. Simply put, right? No, 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 and, that, and that's fair. It's just yeah, a lot of that was pretty disheartening and disgusting once you learned about it as you got older. Because like yeah, I was I wasn't in the same boat because like I didn't know them personally, but like as a kid, I loved those videos and stuff. So it's like now now you know like what they were really like yeah it's it's, it's disheartening so um but last thing before I let you go of course dude you're a streamer now you you're into <laughs> video games like that that's how i found you again was because of your streaming so um i want you to plug anything you got about your streaming because you're going to be streaming in the next half an hour so like that is true is daily thing do you do it at the same time every day like plug away please so uh with streaming <laughs> thank you for this opportunity by the way um yeah with streaming it's it's been an interesting journey for sure because it was something that i've always kept to the back of my head that i even tried doing back when i was at react just a little bit but it wasn't something i had definitive certainty of like yeah i want to do this i want to move in this direction because again when i was a teenager i pushed away the whole celebrity in influence internet thing for so long and so coming back to it now i would say at 100 percent uh part of that influence was me when i was working at new egg working as a streamer I worked as a uh, as essentially as a stream host for Newegg's uh, sales show, and it was just getting back on camera, interacting with a community, people in chat, and just being in a live setting. That I was like, no, yeah, okay, I do still like doing this. I do still like content creation and putting myself out there and just being, you know, whether I'm being a tech savvy uh, uh, assistant on the internet through Newegg and talking talking tech and computers and things to now doing it completely on my own as an independent individual uh, through my own stuff. I mean, I'm Ethan by the woods across all platforms and it feels super weird to say this because I'm not most comfortable plugging myself because self-promotion always feels so cringy and corny to me. But I, you can actually Google me. If you just type Ethan Woods into Google, I'm the first thing that pops up and that is so strange. Yeah. That is, 
like you Google yourself as a kid is a joke thinking it's funny. It's like, oh, what will I find? And then you do it as an adult, at least with the work that I've done. And I'm there. I'm the first yeah. thing you find. And that's super strange. The fact that you can be like, yeah, just Google me. And mm -hmm. like, you will find me. You know, my Instagram is one of the first things that pops up. So streaming and being a content creator is, it's, I would say it's kind of essentially come full circle. It's essentially come full circle from pursuing acting as a kid just for fun and then ending up on React and doing that for almost a decade. And then coming back to just doing it myself and actually starting from the ground up. Because, because I'm not starting while I'm with React or with any media base behind me. It's very much just me starting essentially as any other content creator, starting from the ground up and seeing how to build myself and treating myself as my own business. And it's being it's been a very interesting journey so far. I mean, it's only been maybe a little over a month of me doing it myself. So it's 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 interesting just seeing the little bit of six, the small mini successes I've been having here and there and then seeing how to make it work for myself and try to work for folks more on the social media and collaborating with individuals like you. And again, thank you so much, Quinn, for providing me this opportunity. It is it's been a really interesting, really interesting journey so far. And I mean, I can be found on every platform as Ethan by the woods. And the origin for my name uh, is because my name is Ethan Woods. And I thought it'd be a fun play on words to say by the woods because people get confused. Like, wait, so are you by a woods? And I'm like, no, I'm not actually by a woods, but uh, my both my parents' last names are woods. Therefore, I am by the woods. So, <laughs> you know, I just thought that was a fun play on words and kind of just carried that with me since I was like, I think I started with that username when I was like 19 because before that it was all just goofy joke names like... <laughs> For the longest time, I was I'm that black guy on social media <laughs> just because I thought it was funny. Just because I thought it was funny. Yeah, jeez. Yeah, so, but yeah, that. no, Ethan by the Woods, every platform, whether it be Instagram, TikTok, Twitch, YouTube, uh, it's super easy to find. Just type my name, you'll find me. Amazing. Well, hey, I'll be I'll be watching your stream in, in half an hour. But no, uh, Ethan, man, like, thank you so much for coming on here. This was awesome. It was really cool after watching you. 12 years ago to be able to talk to you now dude it's it's weird how how, how stuff works yeah it man. is it's a small world too man yeah small this was world. everything i could have wanted from this interview and more so yeah again dude thank you so much for coming on here dude thank you so much for having me quinn happy to be here dude all right i'll uh we'll, we'll talk to you to, oh my god we'll talk <laughs> to you later is what i'm trying to say <laughs> no problem man and i'll be streaming live in about 30 minutes and i try to stream about 4 p.m uh, uh pacific time so 4 p.m pacific standard time every single day monday through friday and ideally as i continue doing this hopefully start start starting earlier and streaming for more days of the week so Perfect. that is the game plan amazing all right ethan we'll talk to you later all right talk to you later quinn yeah and that was the quid bar show